Okay. Um, evolutionary perspectives on unhealthy eating and obesity suggest that there's a mismatch between inherited food strategies that promote, promote overconsumption of high energy foods in our current in environment, in which such, such foods are plentiful with minimal energy costs. And this is a pretty big claim, and yet it hasn't actually been experimentally tested. So my PhD has aimed to test this hypothesis, and to do this we've formulated experiments using highly valued edible food rewards that tapped into different uh, aspects of foraging theory in humans. Uh, snacking has been suggested to closely match foraging behaviour, behavior, more so than any other eating behaviours in humans. Uh, these data show that understanding food seeking behaviours can be relevant to understanding weight gain. So the figure on the left shows that the addition of some high calorie foods uh, in the diet, such as crisps, contributes to weight gain in comparison to, to things like fruit. And this is explained by the figure on the right, uh, which shows that when snacks are added to daily consumption, people don't actually compensate their energy intake at mealtimes, meaning an overall uh, increase in energy intake over a day's feeding. And therefore, we focused on the use of high calorie uh, snacks in these experiments. So the first aspect of foraging theory uh, we looked into uh, to test in humans was risk sensitivity theory. And this suggests that risk-seeking behaviours should only be demonstrated when the need for feeding is high. So when energy budgets are low, or similarly when resources are scarce, the likelihood of starvation is increased. Therefore, animals are more likely to take risks to get food, such as uh, inappropriate responses to predators, uh, because risk aversion is actually more detrimental to their evolutionary fitness. However, a second line of experimental work reports that an animal's sensitivity to risk when foraging is heavily influenced by how the risk is actually generated. In experimental models, animals are given a choice between two options with equal average rates of reinforcement. So one is a variable delay schedule, where, for example, food is delivered uh, either immediately or after 20 seconds, and the other is a fixed schedule where food is delivered after 10 seconds. Uh, the variable schedule is reported to be more, uh, the more risky option, since delays can be much shorter or much longer than the more stable fixed schedule. Looking at the top right, uh, top right window, 16 out of the 70 studies, 17 studies, sorry, reviewed, found biases for the variable interval schedule. The lower right window also shows that of those studies that used measures to manipulate energy budgets, such as freely available access to food, none found a statistically significant switch to the risk-averse fixed schedule under positive energy budgets or food abundance. So therefore, when risk is generated by delay variability, animals seem to take risks uh, to receive food at the earliest possible opportunity, regardless of energy states, possibly explaining why people have difficulty compensating their compensating for increased energy consumption. So, to investigate biases for variable over fixed delays in humans, as well as the influence of energy budgets and resource availability in order to test risk sensitivity, our participants completed a binary choice task. Uh, two boxes were presented on a touchscreen. One represented a fixed schedule to food reinforcement of 15 seconds. The other was a variable schedule of either 0 or 30 seconds, so the average rates were, of the boxes were the, were the same. Uh, in this version, we manipulated resource availability as a proxy for scarcity. So in one condition, the food of choice was delivered following the delays 100% of the time, and in the other condition, only 70% of the time. There were 78 trials per participant, split into two blocks, and we had 60 moderately hungry participants who had fasted for about two hours, or well, two hours minimum. And these participants were well matched across demographic and psychometric characteristics. As we're running food seeking experiments, one of the first challenges was to make sure that the rewards were desirable. So to do this, we gave participants a menu of 10 high calorie popular snacks. Uh, participants ranked sweets and savoury separately from one to five in order of preference, then chose their favourite out of the two highest ranking foods to use in the task. Okay, Here we see the effect of the last delay experienced on the x-axis on the proportion of vari variable schedule selections on the y. And what we find overall is that following each type of diff 
each uh, different type of delay, the proportion of variable selections made are at least at 0.5, meaning that we have biases for the variable schedule overall. When food was delivered immediately on the most recent reinforced trial, participants were more likely to choose the more risky variable schedule, and furthermore, this bias was not affected by the likelihood of receiving rewards. This suggests that the delivery of quick food potentiates biases for variable over fixed schedules, suggesting that it is more highly valued than rewards that are delayed. What is also shown is that selections for the variable schedule are also more likely following long delays, although not as much as the short. And this perhaps means that participants are willing to endure the long delay for the chance of receiving immediate food. Furthermore, we see that this bias for risky decision making uh, following immediate rewards is sensitive to body composition. Um, individuals with higher BMIs had heightened biases for the variable schedule when the last reward was delivered immediately, uh, about 75% of the time, in comparison to individuals with lower BMIs. And this suggests that heavier people value immediate food rewards in, compar in comparison to delayed rewards more highly than people in the healthy BMI range. In the second version of this task, we used a preload manipulation to influence state hunger before completing the food seeking task. Um, participants had fasted for 12 hours, and this was checked using a blood glucose reading on entry to the lab. So anybody with a blood glucose reading more than 5.9 millimoles per litre were excluded. To manipulate hunger, one group consumed a 300 calorie vanilla drink and the other group consumed nothing. Both waited for 30 minutes and then completed the food scheduling task. And in this case, it was just one block of the certain condition. This figure simply shows how our preload manipulation on the x-axis influenced participants' state hunger on the y before completing the task. So those in the preload condition, which is the blue line, showed a significant decrease in hunger after consuming the drink and waiting 30 minutes, compared to those in the no preload condition, who simply waited for 30 minutes and reported a slight increase in hunger. Again, we find that our participants were more likely to choose the variable schedule when the last delivered reward was received immediately. However, in this case, we find that this increase is sensitive to our preload manipulation. So those who didn't consume the preload were more hungry, uh, sorry, and were more hungry, were more likely to make subsequent choices for the variable schedule following immediate food rewards than rewards following the fixed schedule, again up to about 75% of choices. And that's in comparison to those in the preload condition. But if you look at those in the preload condition, they still maintain preferences for the variable schedule showing overall biases. And this suggests that hungry individuals value immediate food rewards over delayed rewards more highly than individuals who are less hungry, although the biases for variable schedules following immediate rewards are still evident. evident. So, what does all this mean? We've found that quick food increases people's preferences for variable versus delay schedules for high value food rewards, and that these preferences seem to be sensitive to motivational states and to body composition. And although these biases are well established across the animal literature, it is not known what processes underpin them or their acquisition. One explanation is delay discounting, where the value of rewards are influenced by the time it takes to receive them, and tend to follow these value curves that are on the right-hand side. Heightened value is associated with the immediate reception of rewards, with a reduction in value over time according to either hyperbolic or exponential assumptions. Using a hyperbolic rule, the value of a combination of delays under a variable interval schedule will be higher than that of a fixed intermediate reward due to the disproportionately high amount of value attributed to immediate rewards. Also, we know that people with high percentage body fat have lower area under these curves, meaning that they discount delayed uh, delayed food rewards to, to a higher extent than those with lower percentage body fat. And this is shown by the third set of bars on this bar chart. If you can see that, the high quartile PBF have got lower area under the curves. Yeah? Okay. So, to investigate how these preferences are established, we applied four computational models to our behavioural data. And we assumed that people's preferences or selections are based on the comparison between the respective reward values of the two reinforcement schedules. 
Uh, all model parameters presented here were fit using maximum likelihood estimation. So the first model was a pseudo matching law, which assigned the schedule's values according to the hyperbolic discounting of the rewards received over a window of previous trials, as seen in equation one. Then, whichever schedule had the highest recent discounted value was selected by the model using the matching law as a comparator, which is equation two. So this yielded two free parameters, the size of the previous window of trial outcomes, and k, the discounting factor from the hyperbolic discounting function. The second model is a Q-learning temporal difference model, where action values are updated by the differences between the actual discounted reward received and the predicted return. Temporal difference models follow the same basic structure, which is shown in equation one, where the updated value of taking an action in a state at time t equals the original value of that action plus a learning rate alpha by some form of prediction error delta. In the Q-learning variant of TD models, the prediction error, which is equation two, is the difference between the discounted value of the actual reward received after a delay plus the value of the best action in the next state, minus the original predicted value. The values of either schedule are then plugged into a softmax mechanism, which provides a probability of making each choice on each trial, based on the difference between the two values. The inverse temperature parameter, uh, beta, weights this difference, with more negative values of beta resulting in the more highly valued schedule being chosen with higher certainty, and values closer to zero, resulting in 50-50 predictions. So in this model, we're fitting three parameters, gamma, the discounting rate, alpha, the learning rate, and inverse temperature. The third model added a motivation parameter to Q-learning, which adjusted the learning rate of the temporal difference model. Uh, we assumed that motivation would reduce across selections due to things like satiety. So to model motivation, we used a Gaussian survival function, which is the inverse of the uh, cumulative density function, with the mean and standard deviation being three parameters. Uh, these curves simply show a few examples of the shape that motivation can take, depending on the mean and standard deviation, uh, with motivation on the y-axis and trial number on the x. So on each trial, the learning rate of the Q-learning model was weighted by the motivation estimate. And the addition of motivation yielded an extra two parameters, the mean and standard deviation of the distribution. And this just shows into which part of the equation most motivation fits. Uh, so the delta rule and the softmax are the same as in the previous model. So all that's affected is the learning rate, meaning that the value computations are maintained when motivation is low, but the calculation of new value estimates stops. Finally, we ran a naive Bayes model, which isn't actually a model per se, and this took the probability of choosing variable over fix directly from the data and used that probability to predict choice. And essentially this works as a useful baseline as it assumes that whatever, ha whatever happens in the future will be exactly as what happened in the past, with no learning process or perception of outcome values. Um, this slide is just an example of how our models are able to reproduce the observed data from simulation. So this one is from Q-Learning. Um, each participant's parameter estimates were entered into a simulation of the task, which updated the schedule values according to Q-Learning and used the softmax as a probabilistic choice mechanism. This was run on 78 trials, 2,500 times to average out random noise. I then took the proportion of variable schedule selections following each delay outcome and compared it against the proportion from the real data for each participant. And first of all, if you note that the red dots in the blue are higher than the green, again showing the effect of the last experience delay on the preferences for the variable schedule. We see that in each possible condition, we have strong correlations between the last delay effects of our, of our simulations and the last, last delay effects from our real data, showing that our temporal difference models and their parameter estimates are able to reproduce the patterns of behavior that we observed. Okay. However, an issue with computational modeling 
across the psychological literature is that too much attention is given to how well the models fit the data. And, and by doing this, overfitting can occur. So rather than looking at how well the models fit the data, we need to know how good they are at generalising to unseen data. Um, and this figure is an example of how fitted models are able to account for new observations. So the black dots are the data the model is fit to, the line is the model, the red crosses are new observations. Uh, model A is a poor fitting and poor generalising linear model. Model B is an exponential model which does a good job at explaining the original and new observations. And model C has multiple free parameters and can explain the original observations perfectly but can't generalise to the new observations. So model C is a good example of overfitting a model to data. To validate our models, we ran a version of an accumulative prediction error analysis. And in this case, the parameters were fit to the data uh, multiple times from trial 1 to trial n for each participant, where n ranged from 1 to the total number of trials. These fitted parameters were then used to predict the next 10 trials, which it hadn't seen. Um, we compared the model predictions to the naive Bayes model, which simply predicts the same proportion of variable selections from the data it has already been, been fit to or has seen. So essentially, the better the predictions, the better the model. This shows how well the pseudo-matching law predicts unseen data. So the black line is the naive Bayes baseline, red is the matching law predictions, the y-axis is the percent correct, and x-axis is the number of trials uh, that the model is fit to. And this is for the certain uncertain data, first of all. The pseudo-matching law seems to predict slightly better than the naive Bayes in the certain case, although the error bars seem to overlap quite a bit, and it doesn't seem to predict too well over Bayes in the uncertain. So this one's for Q-learning. Uh, despite some slight fluctuations, uh, Q-learning seems to predict more accurately than naive Bayes in both conditions. Uh, it predicts better than Bayes earlier on in the certain condition, where you expect people to be learning about the delays associated with these two schedules, but later on in the uncertain condition. We also see a 3% increase in predictability across the board, which it's, it's not insubstantial. Um, and this suggests that the addition of a learning process improves the ability to predict unseen behaviour over models that take into account either simple value computations or proportionate choice. We also find similar results when motivation influences the learning rate, although perhaps a steeper increase in predictive ability towards the end in the uncertain condition, which we would tend to expect since reducing motivation only really alters the model later on in the time series when learning has stopped. So what we can see here is that overall, all the models predict better in the certain case in comparison to the uncertain, and that's most likely because our participants were not able to learn the contingencies in the uncertain condition as quickly or as well as they could in the certain. And this is for the preload and non-preload data. Um, you can see that both sets of predictions are about the same since both conditions are reinforced 100% of the time. The pseudo-matching law doesn't seem to perform particularly better than our Bayes baseline in either condition. And Q-learning seems to predict better than Bayes earlier on, and more or less consistently across the no-preload condition. Um, we didn't run our motivation model on the preload, no-preload data, since we were explicitly influencing motivational states before the participants completed the task, and this would have confounded the fits. So these predictions over both data sets show that our participants our participants' behaviour is not simply down to maintaining a preference, but involves some form of computation of action values that change according to the outcomes of the task, potentially with Q-learning, with or without motivation, showing the best predictive ability earlier on in the time series when rewards are delivered on every trial, but also later on when rewards are more stochastic. Okay. In conclusion, in line with the animal literature, our findings demonstrate that humans show modest but consistent biases for variable over fixed interval schedules for high-valued food rewards. We also found that, in, that the immediate reception of food rewards increase preferences for variable over fixed interval schedules, and that this increase is sensitive to body composition and energy budgets, but less so to food availability. We find that temporal difference models seem to capture the early acquisition of preferences when rewards are certain, and late preferences when rewards are less certain in their delivery, using discounting rates, learning rates, and motivation to model preferences. 
In addition, temporal difference models seem to outperform models that assume no learning process in predicting new behaviour. Um, even models that do compute and compare action values from discounted rewards. It seems, therefore, that TD models offer a plausible way of specifying the mechanisms that underlie preferences for variable over fixed interval schedules for high-value food rewards in a foraging context, and may be able to reveal differences in people who are at risk of problem eating and obesity.